Hey, I'm Dr. McCleary, and in this video, I interviewed a colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Zachary Stiles, a former Marine and now clinical psychologist. Dr. Stiles is going to talk a little bit about his journey from Marine to psychologist, and he's going to answer what are psychedelics, what are they used for, and maybe most importantly, why do veterans need to know about them? Glad we're able to do this. I'm sitting here with Dr. Zachary Stiles, former Marine and clinical psychologist. And we're gonna talk a little bit about his path into psychology. If you know about some of my content, you already know a little bit about my path into psychology. But we're gonna talk about a little bit about his path because he had a different path than I did. And then we're gonna talk about what everybody is here for, psychedelics other so some years ago now we were both training at the VA in Martinez California and I always remember the first day Zach as he was known at the time came in and this guy had short sleeve shirt on it was untucked he had some bands on and honestly me being the kind of somewhat rigid um, at times and professional as I am, my first reaction was, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> but as, as we learned together, as, as we grew together in, in our training, what we connected on that was very apparent at the beginning is our passion to help veterans. And we've continued on, on that path together. So, Dr. Stiles, I'm wondering if you can tell um, kind of the audience here a little bit about your path from Marine to clinical psychologist, because that doesn't seem like it fits. Yeah, I hear that a, a lot of the time. Um, and it's, it's, it's an easier thing than an easier transition, I should say, than, uh, than, than some may suspect. I, I uh, invaded Iraq in 2003 and uh, was exposed to um, a significant amount of combat and participated in combat operations uh, and, and really was, was just a, a good friend and a good uh, comrade and uh, uh, a good kind of platoon mate. I think the trajectory, at least when looking back at it, is uh, is easier than some people might suspect. And just being a good friend, a good comrade, and uh, helping out your platoon, helping out your buddy to your left and your right. And uh, as I continued on through my transition, I realized I had a significant amount of baggage from the invasion of Iraq and. Uh, and my my friends and I actually would would keep in contact, call each other, talk each other through things, um, and I I kind of realized I had a little bit of a knack for for psychology, but didn't really think much of it, and uh, didn't really know how to to get help for certain things. And and due to some like cultural messages about veterans, I, I wasn't aware that we could actually shift and change, uh, heal, so to speak. And uh, it wasn't until I, I ended up um, homeless in a, in a shelter that doubled as a homeless shelter in a PTSD clinic for Iraq and Afghanistan veterans in uh, the Yontville uh, area of Napa Valley in California. Um, I, I then got to get together with other veterans who were dealing with the same issues that I was and kind of learning from each other. Uh, we, we started to grow a bit more together. I, I heard things from guys saying that they had joined the Marine Corps because of my tour specifically. And that all of a sudden my, 
my experience was validated by by being with these guys and realizing there was some stuff I needed to honor in myself and my experiences. So I learned as much as I could about combat stress, about PTSD, uh, and and continue to kind of go through the motions we had set up in the uh, military when helping your buddy to your left and your right and at the VA. As, as we we know as veterans, um, there is a, a cultural uh, gap at times for people who have not served or, or lived in, in military communities. Is that the case? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing. Um, so so I, I kept seeing this this gap and saying, you know, somebody should do something about that. And kind of pointed out when it would occur and realizing oh, okay, I, I need to do something about this. And so uh, stepping into to that, I, I started studying and uh, specifically I, I held to my own practices, my own healing through meditation as I, I went through my bachelor's and my doctorate. Um, and uh, with you starting at the Northern uh, California VA healthcare system, began, began running groups and uh, slowly open that from, from mindfulness-based groups into other, other like trauma-related individual sessions. Um, and slowly but surely was able to fill some gaps for folks who, who realized that they didn't have to explain everything culturally to us and could actually just concentrate on what needed to be concentrated on. That's awesome. Yeah. I know a few, few guys like that. <laughs> I know I know one guy as well. <laughs> um so that's awesome. And if you're you're watching this video and you are a veteran and you're thinking about going into this space, there's room for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I continually over those past uh eight to ten years now of being a peer counselor to a master's level therapist to the doctoral level therapist the the constant thing was that i i need more veterans that's that's what i need i don't need to clone myself i just need more of us and and there's space for everybody here absolutely all right so we talked a little bit about how you got into the space i want to know a little bit more about the work that you're doing now with psychedelics I think it's good to note how I got here um, from that, because you don't just show up and, and start working with psychedelics willy nilly. Um, as, as we were working together, um, you, you were a year ahead of me. And so you went off to, to do your internship and I stayed an extra uh, bit of time at the, at the VA. And during that time, I was actually invited down to continue working with US Special Forces uh, in Mexico on the weekends. And so as I was working weekdays at the VA weekends in Mexico, I was uh, helping running groups, acting as a therapist, kind of prepping, holding uh, space and in, in dosing sessions, and then working with folks uh, to integrate their experiences. Um, and so I, I, I did that for a significant amount of time. And uh, really was was just heavily impacted by the the changes that I saw um, in a matter of days really some people have if in the early days would say that that psychedelic sessions are are like 10 years of therapy in in a weekend I after working with it now I would challenge that and offer that psychedelic therapy is like 10 years of a meditative practice so that you're able to be open and focused and uh psychologically flexible mm -hmm. and i watching that was so impactful and seeing the healing process happen it, it really drew me in to want to understand it more and so i i continued to just stay engaged educated myself as much as i could as i was holding space in in those uh places and found myself uh, organizing different people within the VA system who were researching psychedelics. And ultimately it led me to uh, the Translational Psychedelic Research Center, 
at UCSF that had relationships with the San Francisco VA. And so right now what I'm doing is helping out with one of their studies. Uh, the, the, the first one is, is uh, called PUMA. It's a psilocybin trial for methamphetamine addictions that uh, specifically for veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're partnering with some folks at the San Francisco VA and the Oakland VA and the Martinez VA um, in order to, to recruit, and, uh, be able to support uh, veterans throughout the process, um, beginning to end. So that's one example of one trial that I'm doing, but there, there, that is research. That's the research portion of what I'm doing. I'm also facilitating for multiple other trials. So again, holding space for folks, preparing them, holding them through the dosing process, and then integrating those experiences when they're through. Um, and then we're working also uh, in, in scholarly work. So supervising trainees, uh, writing scholarly articles about psychedelics and what we're finding in literature. Right now I'm writing two things um, about facilitators who hold space in psychedelic sessions and their own kind of histories with psychedelic medicines, as well as uh, how best to integrate these practices with the VA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a long paper you're about to write. Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to back up a little bit because you're saying some stuff that I'm understanding what I want to make sure that the audience is watching this video understand. So can we start with what even are psychedelics? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, there's so many answers to that. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you a kind of a broad, simplistic thing to help uh, translate some ideas. Basically, they're, they're psychoactive compounds that alter your perception, your mood, and your cognition. So what they're being, uh, what they have been mostly used for uh, that predates Western civilization are uh, spiritual or, or uh, religious practices. Mm -hmm. um, and what they're most known for today is for uh, clinical and therapeutic value being that they alter a person's mood for what the research says is up to two to three months, sometimes depending on the integration, uh, a year or more, uh, a single experience of a psych psychedelic session. Okay. And really, uh, there's, there's different ways of classifying uh, uh, each psychedelic. Some people have, have their uh, classic psychedelic uh, being LSD, um, psilocybin, uh, 5-MeO-DMT. These are serotonergic compounds that um, can, can really ground people in, in their experiences somatically and, and perceptually, whereas you have non-classic compounds that uh, can be seen as or categorized as uh, disassociatives. So mm -hmm. you're able to kind of step back from a really ingrained process, whether it's a behavior or a thought, and really give it a second look, and really be able to kind of change and so say, do I need to go down this route again? Why am I actually doing it? What's the drive or motivation? It provides really good psychological insights for a lot of folks. Okay. What would you say to people that such as myself, if I wasn't in the field, um, mm -hmm. I would say when I think about psychedelics, I think about a rave out in the middle of nowhere in California, um, people just getting the high out of their mind. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to novices like myself um, mm -hmm. that, would, that only know psychedelics in that way? Yeah. Yeah, I, I always encourage a history lesson. We always learn uh, so much when we look back at the origin stories of, of every character in life. And psychedelics has a really rich origin story in 
in several different cultures around the world because psychedelic properties are actually in every continent on earth and have made their ways into the culture of each continent. Um, so I encourage folks to look at the history and, uh, and also the, the kind of overall uh, growth process that we go through um, when discovering new things, coming up with new ideas about these new things and really growing with them, uh, that there are, there are different ways of expressing and experiencing uh, these new compounds. And I, I honestly, I've never been to Burning Man. I hear good things, um, but that has not been a part of my experience either. Um, and so I, I can't speak specifically to certain walks of recreation or, or life in general, but my experience with it has been one of uh, sacredness and clinical value when it comes to both uh, spiritual and clinical practices. Um, and so to acknowledge acknowledge the fact that we're growing together, that we're, we're learning about these properties. As you can look back even not so long ago in the 1950s and 60s where uh, it was like we had our first beer and we were just like, woo, yeah. And we had to really hone it in because it was, it was being used in many places in our society in a way that was not thoughtful or, or mindful of the process and respectful of, of what these compounds can do for us because they can be incredibly value, but valuable. Uh, but there's, there's a kind of deeper, deeper understanding that, that one has to have in order to, uh, to hold and, and utilize them properly. That's well said. Thanks. <laughs> That's off the cuff. <laughs> <laughs> so um, why do you think it's important for veterans to know about these types of treatment? Because this is something that a lot of veterans and a lot of um, civilians as well just don't know about and are unaware of. Yeah. Yeah, I so number one is the educational piece. I've got guys from my platoon, you know, sending me messages, calling me just like, hey, I'm going to take a bunch of mushrooms now. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's not really how it works. Mm -hmm. um, the, Thank you for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, there's there's a general understanding of of how best to actually use the medicine. Um how best to interact with it yourself, to know your own boundaries in order to actually get something valuable from it. Um, and I think right now, so the benefits that we're finding and how they align to the veteran uh, cohort is uh, through, a, through a, a triad that I've been looking at at least, um, the, the TBI, PTSD and chronic pain aspects. Mm -hmm. um many times kind of the conundrum that a lot of providers have is that these all three of these as aspects are are happening within the same regions of the brain so it's hard to see what's actually uh the originator of of different manifestations or behaviors and at the same time uh psychedelics are actually treating treating each of these in the same region so multiple aspects of, of very common issues within the veteran community are being treated on a core level, whether it's TBI, PTSD, or chronic pain, the, the kind of top-down cognition theory we have of something like PTSD, where our, our brain is trying to tell our body to calm down, but our body's not having it. We're, mm -hmm. we're locked in a cycle. Um, the the aspects or mechanisms of, of uh, psychedelics are able to um, calm down both body and mind and uh, allow them to kind of process, able to calm down both body and mind in a way that is uh, aware of the self and environment. So you're able to take things in really mindfully. Mm -hmm. um, and I think 
I think that's one aspect of it. Um, but as we get into the weeds, what we're finding is that the synapses that are connected to these uh, different regions are actually um, strengthened and fostered um, by the serotonergic properties. So we're really able to feed the synapses that need to be fed and alter or prune the synapses that are no longer, um, no longer helping or, or serving the individual. Okay. That's a lot there. That is, it is a lot. There's a ton to this that it's hard to know at times uh, how, much to, how much to go into with certain aspects. But I think the general understanding that I like to impose or, or offer in part um, is that these are core medicines. And whether it is one, one uh, ailment or all three, it's going to get to the core of the issue um, for a lot of people. Okay, kind of cutting the snake head off the snake uh, type of analogy. Yes. Um, and where I see psychedelics is possibly, you know, being helpful to a lot of different individuals, especially with PTSD, which is a large majority of the people that I treat, is it kind of takes the armor off. Um, when the, and if you looked at any content on, my channel, I talk about avoidance all the time as kind of the core symptom of PTSD. Um, and whether that's on purpose and it's very conscious and the veteran knows exactly what they're doing, which is not going over there or not talking to that certain person or whatever it is, um, or is more unconscious. Um, it seems like with psychedelics, it kind of, um, loosens up that armor, takes away a bit of the avoidance piece so that people actually can do and process what they need to process. Um, which of course, in therapy is one of the biggest barriers. A lot of people just aren't gonna to come to us anyway um, because of that avoidance. Who wants to talk about the worst time ever in their life? The answer is nobody. Um, so being able to, um, have a medicine or a form of treatment where that almost, uh, bad word of vulnerability, um, takes place in kind of a short, um, time frame and a safe time frame. Uh, that's my, my guess where you're involved. Um, making sure that people feel like they're in a safe environment. Because if they're not, obviously they're not gonna do this. Um, and in that vulnerable space, the work that needs to be done actually has an opportunity of getting done. Yeah. Am I oversimplifying that or am I getting it No, right? no, that's really, so that's, that's the other piece to this. I'm glad we're going there because that's, uh, what we've been discussing is the medicine portion of psychedelics and it's it's now beginning to so the the setting so the medicine portion and kind of intentions for it would be considered set and then setting of psychedelics so how to hold space what environment you're in who you're working with how you're working with them setting is is slowly becoming something that we are able to look at within research as well. It's something that's incredibly important as to us as psychologists. Um, there's an aspect to the importance of, of how it is that we're connecting with folks, both culturally, the messages that we're, we're uh, offering and helping people with, as well as uh, how we hold folks and um, how best to uh, allow allow someone to experience not only themselves uh, but the the world around them to feel safe in order to dive into emotional processes, really ingrained uh, behaviors. So that's that's the area that we're going to go into now. So I'm I'm a, a huge proponent of of good cultural. Uh, kind of community care uh, aspects of, of what we do. Um, and so I, I think it's incredibly valuable for 
for programs like the Fireside Project to come in and have veteran peer support. I believe they're doing it as well, actually, at the Portland VA, um, where they have veteran peer counselors actually sitting with uh, other veterans who are moving through the, the medicine process. And it's, it's something to begin to have that kind of bond at the very beginning so that you can understand that you are safe, that we're going to go through something significant and uh, that we're able to, to hold you in the container that we've, we've provided here. And then with the general understanding, so this comes from more traditional backgrounds as well, that's informing a lot of this work, uh, again, culture, um, is that we're, as facilitators, just holding space for the other person to open up and to connect with the medicine. There is uh, an overall theory that's, that's range predates uh, Western civilization, uh, it kind of is born from animism, the, the idea that the divine is in nature. And in these natural compounds, we experience some divine wisdom and being able to hold space for a person to sit with that divine wisdom within a, an aspect of a compound or themselves. Um, it is simply our duty to sit and allow someone to have their own experience without imposing our own thoughts, needs, whatever it is that we think we should be doing as clinicians to really just step back and allow somebody to, to be and to find uh, what it is that it's their time to find, to heal in ways that they're ready to heal. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like um, the idea is not actually doing the healing, but getting out of the way so the healing can take, can happen on its own. Uh, right. A lot of doctors will, or physicians will, will say, well, that's just how the body works, which is the body heals itself. We can help you with your symptoms, but, um, and we can help your body do its job, but really exactly. the body is doing all the healing. Mm -hmm. 100%. So that's, that was really uh, promoted by Michael Mithoffer, an MD. Who, who started a lot of the MAPS training, that exact ana analogy, where your body has the ability, once it gets cut, to really self-heal. We can help you out with, with uh, any kind of penicillin if you get an infection, but really your body's going to take over. And it's the same thing uh, with your psyche. Your psyche, the reason why we compartmentalize a lot of the time is because our psyche has said, you're not ready for this. You're, you're going to, you're going to forget this right now. We'll, we'll deal with this later. Mm -hmm. um, and then slowly, but surely your psyche is, is able to kind of un, unfold, un, 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 uh, unveil some things that, that you're ready to deal with. Um, and this is a lot of the time, I think, uh, a general anxiety for folks stepping into uh, psychedelic care mm -hmm. is that there's a general uh, <clears throat> there's a general message from from uh, decades past that all drugs are are bad and that we are under the influence, which means we cannot actually say what is right and wrong. And uh, when in fact we have a significant amount when under these these compounds we actually have a, a significant amount of say so um to be able to say i want to i want to look into this i actually want to turn that down a little bit i don't want to go so so hard on that mm -hmm. or uh you know let's go a little deeper over here there's there's more um there's more autonomy than i think some people have been led to believe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, for people that are maybe overly controlled like myself. Um, <laughs> no, what? Are you kidding? I have no idea. <laughs> Something to say to them might be that this isn't that you are just going to lose total control. Um, you will still have control during these processes, but it'll be easier for you to make some of those decisions if you want to go deeper or not. Yes. Yeah. All right. 
I know that that is more comforting for me. And my guess is it's probably more comforting for a lot of veterans as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, so the fact that you have control there too, I think it's also good to be a little uh, anxious about this stuff. Like change is hard, it's scary. And we should, we should be a little anxious about it. We don't know what's gonna happen half the time when it comes to change. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this really strikes people at, at the core. And it's, I think fear or anxiety comes from a place of respect and comes from a place of, of awe and, and humility that's, uh, that's respectful for, for lack of a better term. There's kind of a, a negative connotation we can have around fear or control when in actuality we're, we're seeking safety and, and we should. It's kind of what we're doing right now in, in the processes we have at Tripler is to do the research and make sure that we're utilizing best practices as we move forward. That's great. And I think that's a great way to kind of wrap up here. Um, it also seems like we probably need to have another conversation sometimes. Absolutely. So <laughs> I, I, I love to have you back. We'll, we'll mm-hmm. talk again. Um, because I know what I will probably get as soon as I post this video is a lot of questions and a lot mm-hmm. of questions that I probably will not have the answer to. The, you, well, we'll, we'll try and get it together because we can, I'm sure we've worked together in the past and it's turned out pretty well. It has. We've helped a lot of veterans, mm-hmm. which at the end of the day is all that really matters. That's right. All right. Well, I'm glad that I was able able to catch you. I know you're hard to catch. Thanks, Uh, brother. And we'll do this again, brother. Absolutely. I'm in. I hope this video was helpful for you. I know I learned a lot. So consider liking this video or consider subscribing to my channel if you want to learn more about mental health. But more important than that, if this video and this interview was helpful for you, well, that means they can possibly be helpful for another service member or another veteran. So I ask that you share it with them. Because at the end of the day, that's really what all this is about. One veteran trying to help another.